Hello? Let's see. Good evening. I want to go and try and get started. So, good evening and welcome to tonight's Baker Institute Student Forum debate between the Young Democrats and the Rice Conservative Forum. My name is Gabe Quadra and I'm going to be your moderator tonight. There are times as students where it's easy to feel disconnected from uh, the issues facing Washington. Tonight's topic, however, hits those of us who live inside the hedges just as squarely as those who live across America. Everyone here knows someone preparing to enter a job market whose unemployment rate has remained stagnant at about 9%. For many of us, this is a personal reality. And we look at the fiscal, mo monetary, and international realities of today, the outlook at times seems even more bleak. This evening we will hear two plans designed to spur job creation and put Americans like you and me back to work. Representing the Young Democrats will be Miles Bugby, Kevin Bush, Rahu Reki, and Niraj uh, Sal Salhorcha. <laughs> Sorry, Raj. <laughs> uh, the Rice Conservative Forum team consists of Anthony Loriello, Rohini Sigaretti, Taylor Williams, and Matthew Neaters. Before we get started, I just have a couple of housekeeping things to take care of. You should have each received a card, or a couple cards. One is a ballot uh, saying your kind of political leanings, whether you're, a, a, um, I believe, fiscal conservative, fiscally liberal, or somewhere in the middle. We're going to collect those right here at the beginning, so if you could fill those out and pass them to the left, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, my left, you're right, excuse me. Um, another card will be uh, saved for the end of the debate, at which um, you can mark which plan appealed more to you. In the middle, we're going to ask questions based on the question card you received. So if you could pass those up as you have questions, we'll have people monitoring along the side. And then at the end, we'll have an open uh, question session where you can raise your hand. So, so with that, we're going to get started. So please help me welcome tonight's debaters. All right, Miles. Uh, the Democrats are going to start, and they'll be followed, followed by the Rice Conservative Forum. America is in the midst of the worst unemployment crisis since the Great Depression. I stand before you today to discuss how we reach this crisis and how our balanced plan will create jobs. During the last decade, Americans borrowed against their homes, hoping that home values would rise indefinitely. Then in 2007, the bubble burst. Americans found themselves underwater on homes they could no longer afford and began defaulting on their mortgages. The ensuing 2008 financial crisis caused a stock market collapse that wiped out $8 trillion in household wealth. The, um, as the total demand for goods and services fell, layoffs intensified, with more than 700,000 Americans losing their jobs in January 2009 alone. While the stimulus ended mass layoffs and stabilized the economy, healthy job growth has not yet returned. Why? There are two words. Demand shortfall. After the financial crisis, businesses fired workers to reduce costs. As job losses spread, workers who still had their jobs cut back on their purchases to, reduce, um, to protect their own incomes. When consumers aren't spending, businesses aren't growing, which means businesses aren't hiring. Therefore, a demand shortfall creates a job shortfall, which is how we reach the jobs crisis. To break this vicious cycle, we must take decisive action. Our balanced and bipartisan plan begins with five immediate policies to boost job creation and drive American economic growth. First, we support state and local aid to prevent the layoffs of teachers, firefighters, and police officers. Since 2010, more than 600,000 state and local workers have lost their jobs due to budget cuts. This has created negative spillover effects as crime rates rise in communities with fewer police officers and students suffer from the loss of talented teachers. Second, our plan extends emergency unemployment insurance, which will help the more than 45% of the unemployed who have been out of work for 27 weeks or more. When they spend their unemployment benefits, the money goes right back into the economy, creating jobs. The third step is to extend the current payroll tax cut. 
Nearly three in five Republican voters recently said that they support this tax cut, which provides the average family with an additional $1,500. Fourth, we fund renovations to K-12 schools and community colleges. In the short run, this will stimulate the construction sector, which was hit hardest by the recession. In the long run, 35,000 schools will be modernized. Finally, it's time that we repair our crumbling infrastructure. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers, our infrastructure received a D grade. At Rice, we would be ashamed of that grade, and we should be ashamed of that for our infrastructure. We are $2 trillion behind on repairs to roads, bridges, airports, and railways. Our infrastructure plan will leverage public dollars to rebuild America's infrastructure, creating more jobs. These five balanced solutions will bolster demand and job growth. Rahul will now explain how our plan also lays the foundation for long-term job creation. Thank you. The prosperity America has enjoyed over the last several decades is a result of our competitive edge in science, technology, and innovation. In fact, scientific research and development has been estimated to account for 40 to 70 percent of economic growth in the United States over the last half century. Yet today, America is falling behind on virtually every key metric of innovation. Our federal spending on R&D as a percentage of GDP has been cut in half since 1950. But meanwhile, the fastest growing economies in the world, places like China, Singapore, and South Korea, continue to increase their R&D investments over five times uh, more rapidly than what we see here in the United States. Furthermore, today we are ranked 25th in the world in science engineering education. And the achievement gap for our students, particularly at the early ages, continues to widen. We are not producing enough Americans with the right amount of STEM talent and STEM training to out and innovate the rest of the world. They do not have the right skill set. Nor are we importing them. With our current immigration paradigm, as many as 200,000 uh, scientists and engineers around the world trying to get in here are turned away. We are turning away talent that can uh, drive the engine of our economy going forward. You know, most people don't realize this, but Google was originally funded by a $2.5 million NSF grant, the National Science Foundation grant. Today, Google provides over $200 billion in economic value to the country. Given the level of research funding we see today, we are missing out on the Googles of the future. And that's not a risk that we, as a country, can afford to take. That's why our jobs plan calls for a 20% increase in federal research and development spending. In addition, we want to staple a green card onto every PhD produced by an international student within our borders, because we want that talent right here producing the next Googles. Furthermore, uh, a target expansion of pre-K education, where the income or the educational gap starts to diverge, will provide enough talent to within our borders to fuel the uh, Googles of the future going forward. And finally, we want to develop regional innovation clusters, the Silicon Valleys of the future, to ensure that all of these various components of the innovation ecosystem can come together and again create jobs going forward. And not just in computers and information technology, but in clean tech and green tech, biotechnology, and the industries of the future. These pro-growth policies are based on sound, objective, bipartisan consensus from experts in government, academia, and industry. As such, our plan will pave the way to a long and prosperous future for the United States. Miles and Rahul just outlined, just outlined our plan to help solve the current jobs crisis. But you all must be wondering, how are we going to pay for this plan? Well, we could have just said we're going to close some tax loopholes, but that would have been too vague. We could have just said the U.S. government should take advantage of historically low borrowing costs, some real interest rates are even negative on U.S. Treasury bills. But that would have been, that would have been too easy. We could have just left the bill unfunded. Hey, that uh, that's the end of your time, so we're going to have to save that part for the next section. So that's our seven minutes. So. All right. <laughs> so now the rights conservatives are going to have their response and present their plan. All right. 
I don't know. I love movies, especially action movies, and the type of ones where the characters get stuck in quicksand. And it kind of reminds me of America right now, in which you get stuck in the quicksand and you struggle, and the heroes look and try to think of a new way to get out of the quicksand, while those who die just struggle even harder. The Obama administration began with spending over $700 billion on stimulus. It turned out to cost over $200,000 per job. We've already cut the payroll tax from 6.2 to 4.2. And yet, we still have unemployment rate around 9%. Unfortunately, those on the left think we should just struggle harder. It's time we took a step back and looked at our situation and thought of new, innovative, bipartisan solutions to solve this job crisis and make America the best place to do business. That's why us on the Rights Conservative Forum have three plans, three steps for reform. The first is regulation reform, to make sure that our regulation is smart and efficient and isn't putting unnecessary externalities and costs on the American business. The second is immigration reform, to make sure that those who want to come and those who have already studied in this country can and contribute to this economy. And third is tax reform, so that we don't have the most complicated tax system in the world that requires thousands of lawyers to understand and has a huge drain on our economy and makes American and puts American business in the hole. We can't spend more money. We are already $14 trillion in debt. And we merely need to look across the Atlantic to see the dangers of going further in debt. We need to ensure that American businesses can be confident that they can invest in America's future and that they can hire more jobs. We got into this trouble by the individual Americans borrowing what they shouldn't. And now the American government is doing more of the same. We can't afford to do this anymore. America needs to be a place where... As it, as it has been historically, where entrepreneurs and small businessmen can feel comfortable put, putting risks and making investments. And now to present the first part of our plan, Taylor Williams. Yeah, Washington, like Anthony said, Washington has tried everything from stimulus to quantitative easing in order to restart our economy. Our opponents offer another stimulus. Stimulus, in an effort to ease the pain of recession, is interfering with the natural process of asset prices finding their bottom. Growth will move forward um, only after asset prices adjust to reality. Only then will businesses take risks, expand, and hire when they see opportunity. We wish to eliminate government interference in the market by proposing a plan for regulatory reform. Regulation, while well-intended, is often passed under the guise of consumer protection, safety, and environmental concerns. And it nearly always leads to unintended consequences, such as decreased capital investment, increased costs, lower profits, higher prices and less choice for consumers, and subsequently higher unemployment. It can also be used to protect market share and profits of current players in the industry. Regulation must be analyzed for its degree of protection and legitimized based on its cost to the American economy. Already in the United States, a small or medium-sized business pays an average of $10,000 a year per employee in regular, regulatory costs alone. In order to lower these costs and free up capital, we wish to form a board of industry leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs who will conduct a comprehensive review of all regulation and offer Congress a list of harmful outdated, and overly complicated regulation to be cut. Also, we wish to enact tort reform that will end frivolous lawsuits that cost companies billions each year and stifle production. These reforms will cut the cost of doing business in America and lower the barriers to injury for entrepreneurs. By advocating for less government and smarter regulation, we wish to allow the economy to recover without the government interrupting free market forces. Ultimately, Increased capital for business will grow demand and lead to more value-added jobs for America. Thank you, Taylor. Just as it is our job as the Rice Conservative Forum to provide a plan to find more jobs in America, it is our job as Americans to make America a good place to do business. Just as our, as the Rice Young Democrats proposed, we must become better in science, engineering, technology, and math. 
However, the way to do this is to streamline the immigration process. Currently, we have 500,000 immigrants that have obtained H-1B visas but cannot get them renewed because the backlog time is three years to four years. These are people that have been educated in the United States, whose PhDs and master's degrees have been funded by National Science Foundation grants and other grants to the United States government. We have paid for these people to be in our country, to become educated and to contribute to society, and thus we must keep them them in our country through smarter immigration reform. We propose a merit-based system in which those who have served our country in the areas of science, technology, and engineering and other graduate studies can stay in this country and have a streamlined visa processing. Furthermore, this could lead to better developments in getting green cards and citizenship to these people. For these reasons, we strongly urge a reformed immigration policy that would allow those with H-1B visas to renew them and stay in this country. And now I'd like to open it to Matt Eaters. Thank you. So no matter how uh, Taylor was going to go about the regulation reform, I think that we need for tax policy a committee to look at the tax code and justify every little credit deduction, all those different things that were put in to benefit certain constituencies, which don't necessarily benefit the whole of the country. We need to reevaluate those and, if need be, get rid of them. They mostly just help the rich and those who are connected to the politicians. They are not in America's best interest. With regards to more general, all right, more specific policies, I would suggest that we adopt a small-scale VAT tax, such as 3 4%, just so we can get this off the ground, see if we can properly organize one of these structures in our country, and with that, we would widen our tax base, increase savings in the general populace because they don't want to consume at higher prices, and um, we would counter any of the effects regressive on the VAT with slight tax rebates for those people. Regarding income, corporate, and capital gains taxes, we really need to adjust the levels that they are that we are leveling on our populace. With regards to the income tax, we should make it formula-based rather than having the stepwise function. It doesn't make any sense, and it allows people to get out of their taxes, and it allows people with those deductions to avoid our system. Additionally, with the corporate tax rate, we should lower it to 20%, but also increase through our original idea of the committee reevaluating the tax code to um, get more out of the corporate corporations. Regarding co capital gains tax, we want that to be dropped because all it does is decrease investment opportunities because if you do not have a liquid market after your investment, you have no incentive to invest. Thank you. This, now for uh, Ms. Loriello. In conclusion, we ask for three major reforms. Government is not the solution. We must make sure that government is streamlined to allow the private sector of America to do what it has always done best, create jobs and create innovation. That's why we're asking for reform of regulation, reform of labor and immigration, and reform of our tax system, which is exceptionally overwrought. I think these are three things that all Americans agree that we should be doing. It's time we stopped struggling, and it's time we started succeeding. Thank you. All right, guys, so now the Dems will have a, a second to respond. If you have any questions, please write them down on that card and pass them to the left and indicate whether your question is for the, the Dems, the conservatives, or for both. So I just want to spend a quick, quick second here going over how we're going to pay for our plan because we I think it's very, very important. So the way we're going to pay for it is we're going to cut, we're going to close a $714 billion loophole. We're going to raise $714 billion over 10 years by closing an inefficient job-killing loophole. Specifically, I'm talking about the step up in basis for the capital gains tax. So essentially, very simply, in this country, we pay a capital gains tax. So what that means basically is if you buy a share of Apple computers for 100 bucks, two years down the road, you sell that share for $300 you're going to pay tax on the $200 profit, right? You take the $300 market value that you sell it for, subtract out the basis, which is $100, that's how much you paid for it, and then you pay tax on the $200. But there's a special rule uh, if you inherit the capital gain. So let's say that, you know, 
you have a wealthy um, uh, aunt, and she decides to bequeath to you shares in Apple Computer. And she bought the shares at $100 50 years ago, and now the shares are worth $1,000. So she gives them to you, they're worth $1,000. When you sell those shares, the basis steps up from 100 to 1,000, and therefore you avoid paying that tax. So what does this do? It, first of all, it costs the government $719 billion over 10 years. Secondly, it creates what's known as the lock-in effect. That is to say, because people want to defer those tax payments, because you don't want to pay the tax, you want to wait until you die so that the basis steps up, you do not s sell the asset, therefore you don't make investments that you might make. So simply put, we're going to close an inefficient, job-killing tax preference, which will pay for our entire plan. The conservative plan will not resolve the jobs crisis because it does not recognize the fundamental problem, the demand shortfall. Businesses will not prosper if no one is buying their goods. The conservatives' board of so-called industry experts would be captive to business interests. This board is destined to fail because its members are working for the businesses they're supposed to be regulating and not for the American people they're supposed to be protecting. Letting industries write their own rules not only is bad for society, but it's an anti-business policy. The regulators on this board would undercut their competition and boost their own bottom lines. And this conflict of interest would lead to more pollution and more dangerous products. Society wouldn't save money, but would face staggering costs from higher medical bills and legal bills. This is a recipe for disaster. We agree that attracting innovators from abroad is critical for America's future. But because the rest of their plan fails to create jobs, expanding the pool of American workers would actually make the situation worse. Immigration reform only makes sense in a plan that creates jobs for everyone. Their plan for tax reform also does nothing to address the demand shortfall. In fact, according to the Tax Policy Center, their VAT or national sales tax would raise taxes on middle-class Americans. Higher taxes take money out of the hands of consumers, reducing aggregate demand. When demand falls, businesses supply less and lay off workers. Adopting this anti-growth policy could risk a double-dip recession. Abolishing the capital gains tax is a radical idea that would blow a hole in the federal budget and do nothing to help the middle-class Americans who drive our economy. Furthermore, their plan to cut the corporate tax is not a solution to the crisis. Corporations are already awash in cash. They don't need more incentives to invest. They need more customers. The conservative plan Kevin, misdiagnoses the patient hand, and prescribes the wrong medicine. Thank you. All right, so our next, our next section is to ask the, some written questions to each group. And then we'll um, then we'll open them to, for, up for cross examination. So if both sides just keep your answers brief, so we can get as many questions through as possible. All right. So we're going to start with um, the rice with the rice Democrats. So our first question: Education is a crucial component of job preparation. The government has spent trillions of dollars on educational subsidies, loan guarantees, and teachers' pay. The result has been mounting debt, stagnant productivity, and hordes of over-credentialed students who can neither find a job nor repay their debts to taxpayers. What is your plan to allow uh, for American education without be, uh, bleeding dry taxpayers or students? Oh, okay. Well, well we're going to do the Dems first, and then we'll switch over to the conservatives. So, look, uh, you know, we need to be clear. Certainly, the government has spent and invested in the past on education, but what we're calling for is smart investments, and we're calling for key investments in a pre-K education, which we know if we make those investments now in pre-K, that's going to help, you know, reduce the achievement gap as kids, you know, progress uh, through the grade. So we're calling for smart investments in education. And studies have shown that these are higher yield investments. I would say that like education, like all these problems, simply throwing money isn't the solution. Some of our worst school districts are some of the ones we throw the most money at. I think it's time that we looked at different ways. Just, In fact, I think the Obama administration's greatest accomplishment has been looking at different ways in vouchers and charter schools and looking at innovative new ways to tackle education instead of simply spending 
throwing more money and letting the teaching teachers union get paid in the way that they want to. I just want to be very clear. Vouchers have not been shown to increase educational outcomes. They have not been shown in Cleveland or Milwaukee or Washington. Excuse I want me, to be clear you, on that. We're answering questions now, not attacking each other. That comes later. All right, guys, this one's for the Dems. So you talked about wanting to improve infrastructure. They wanted to see if you could elaborate on that plan if there, with any specifics. So essentially, this is what's going to happen. The government will set aside some funds to leverage private capital. Currently, companies are sitting on $2 trillion of cash. We have 15% unemployment in the construction sector. I mean, as you heard from uh, Miles, we have a D in our construction uh, uh, in our infrastructure, combine all that together. This is a perfect storm. This is the time to improve our infrastructure, improve our schools, roads, buildings, bridges, make them more energy efficient, etc. That's what we're talking about. And I just want to be clear, this is bipartisan. So Senator K. Bailey Hutchinson of our own state has endorsed this plan. And supported by the uh, AFL-CIO, uh, as well as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So we know this is bipartisan. All right. So one, another question for the Dems. Um, uh, people are okay. So they, this person wants to know that uh, with your aid to uh, local governments and state governments that are that are falling behind on their uh, unable to pay teachers and such, um, whether or not this is actually rewarding states that were irresponsible during the good times and thus kind of disincentivizing states which have been fiscally responsible. Okay, as, as I said earlier, state and local governments have laid off 600,000 workers since the Great Recession began. While some states were fiscally irresponsible, the funds from our plan will go directly to keeping teachers, firefighters, and police officers in their jobs. This plan is about keeping people on the jobs. That's how we create jobs, by keeping people working and so they can help put more money into the economy to create jobs. So our money is going to go to fiscally responsible states to create more jobs. All right, and then we're going to try and transition here. So we'll do one question for both and then transition to the conservative forum. So starting with uh, the Dems, uh, this person is curious about how we can reform the death tax um, in order to limit plutocracy while preserving the wealth of the middle class. So, look, uh, certainly America was founded on the notion that if you work hard, you can keep your wealth. We agree with that. But it was also founded on the notion that we're not a plutocracy, we're a meritocracy. So, you know, we're talking, um, you know, we're talking about uh, – reforming the step up in basis that goes to this and we're also saying you know, you know we could envision a plan where possibly some of the initial uh bequeathed uh funds are exempted but at some point i mean if someone's giving you know their children like 10 million 20 million dollars we have to tax that or else we're going to end up with a plutocracy higher income inequality we're already seeing that growing you know america is about income mobility right it's the american dream that you can start out from the bottom of the ladder and work your way up and become you know an industrial titan and you know without these sorts of policies in place to prevent a plutocracy from taking place you know that american dream is is gone uh, dems would you like to respond to that or conservatives excuse me thanks joe <laughs> i would say uh, actually can we just move on to the next question or do we have to yeah that's fine right, thanks <laughs> All right. Um, we've got lots of questions for the conservatives. <laughs> All right. So this person would like to see how the conservative forum would respond to the idea that there have been 20 straight months of private sector growth under the uh, Obama administration, according to some reports. Is this an example of the failure of the Obama administration? No. I would say that this is an example of us moving after the liquidity trap and the economy starting to – I mean, it's growth, but it's languishing growth, and it's – I mean, thank God there was some growth, but it wasn't the kind of growth we need. We're still at 9.10, 9.1% unemployment. And I think just the saving of the banks is why we had that growth. We, The Obama administration started out in terrible conditions, and really anything was growth at that point. Uh, just one point we'd like to add. Um, Anthony mentioned that we're, we're, we've been in a liquidity trap. That means essentially that monetary policy doesn't work, which leaves us with fiscal policy. Our plan is the only plan that will create jobs now by effectively using fiscal policy. Their plan leaves it up to the future and hopes their plan will work. Our plan will work. All right. This one. <laughs> All right. So the next question for the conservative forum. Um, this person uh, was looking at your. You're saying that crowding out has been a problem in our economy, but they note that interest uh, rates have been at record lows, and yet we still haven't seen a lot of private se uh, sector investment. How would you respond to that idea? Well, lowering. We can't lower interest rates more because it won't work. Just like we can't spend more of the money we don't have. 
we can't afford some of the solu- the Democrats, the tired old solutions that Washington has, we can't afford right now. We need to reform Washington so that we can allow business to thrive and create jobs. I don't the de- the Democrats offer to pay for their plan by ending a tax loophole, which we would be in favor of examining. But we the their plan is going to cost more than they say it is. 9 out of 10 plans in the American government puts forth goes over budget. They have exceptionally specific numbers on how much their plan is going to go cost, which I find strange when America can't put a road on the ground without knowing how much it costs. <laughs> we'll say we're almost across exact. We'll save it for that. <laughs> All right, we'll do one more one more question for the conservative forum and then we'll switch to the uh, to the cross examination. So, um <laughs> All right, so this this person wants to ask the conservative forum about their why they want to use a, a value added tax. Uh, this person is arguing that it's a regressive tax to uh, that relies most on people who spend more of a higher percentage of their income. It is a regressive tax in that it is a consumption tax, but our plan would be receiving a lot more tax receipts from. What, our, what system we already have, and the VAT would just be a small-scale, widening sort of tax. It would widen the tax load since everyone purchases products, everyone consumes. So the point there is not that it's regressive because it's such a small percentage of the load. And I did recommend having rebates for those underneath the poverty line, which is the traditional way to go about a VAT and is also usually exempting food, and other necessary purchases. Um, Just to add to that, the VAT is employed by almost every country in the OECD, including those who are far more liberal than us in Europe. And I'd also like to add that 45% of Americans don't pay any income tax. If we're going to solve our debt crisis, we're going to have to have everyone put a little skin in the game, as Representative Cantor said the other week, and we're going to have to broaden the tax base. All right, thank you. Now we're going to switch over to the cross-examination. So how this will work, each side will have um, five minutes to ask the other side questions. We ask you to keep both of your questions and responses brief so we can try and get through as many questions as possible. So uh, Rice Dems, you're up asking questions first. Okay. So the 47% of Americans who pay no federal income taxes do pay payroll taxes and property taxes and are mostly senior citizens, single mothers, students, and disabled Americans who have little income to tax. So why do you support raising taxes on these people? We're not we're not incredibly increasing their tax and actually going through the tax reform and cutting some of the deductions could in fact lower their taxes and cutting some of the um, preferential treatments and making sure that we have a fair tax system for all Americans. I would say that I'm sorry, but we need to move on. That's not what your plan says. It says you want to flat, flatten the tax bait. Base. By definition, if you want to do that, uh, you're raising taxes on these people, and this would do nothing to address the crisis. Next question. Okay. So, you guys, Dems, please keep your statements to questions. So, according. <laughs> so, there, there's a recent study that looked at uh, several Fortune 500 companies, and what they found was that the average real tax rate that these companies pay is 18.5%. Your plan, uh, you know, supports lowering them to 20 percent, but that's that's raising the corporate tax rate at a time where we're in a recession and these corporations need to create jobs. Well, why do you support raising taxes on these job creators? Because it's not an even basis that these people are being taxed on. Some of them can get out of their taxes much easier than others. Right. But if we brought it down to a flat rate and actually enforced it without having all of these deductions and credits, we would be able to. If this is so. I, I'm sorry, I mean, we're, we're short on time. If this is so, then, then you, what you did was mislead us, right? Because... Hey, Rod, hey let's, let's let them answer the question. Do you guys know what a question, question is? Usually it's a two-part game. We're, we're asking the question. Anthony, we're asking the question. Please, please. Give her a whole moment. You, right. you wanted to reduce the corporate tax rate to 20%, right? And the only way, the only way they would pay less than 20% is if you keep those loopholes, which you're trying to Question, eliminate. please. Right, so I'm asking. So how, how do you explain this contradiction? So you're saying that some companies should pay less taxes because they have the better lawyers or better connections in Washington? No, that's what you're saying. You're saying <laughs> – We're just saying uh, – this is what we're saying, Anthony. Anthony, this is what we're saying. We're, we're saying that every company should pay a 20 percent corporate tax rate. 
So you want to raise ta- All right, your, your plan calls for the contra- contraction of government. Since the expiration of the stimulus, as I already mentioned, more than 600,000 state and local workers have lost their jobs due to budget cuts. Do you believe that reducing the size of government by firing workers will create jobs? We think that if we continue on the path that you have us with more government spending, there won't be any government jobs, or our government jobs will be determined by the IMF or someone holding our loans. But if I, if I may, but do you have a plan to protect the teachers, firefighters, and police officers who are about to lose their jobs? If we don't get America out of the current debt crisis, the teachers, firefighters, and police officers that we all know and love won't have any jobs whatsoever. If you look at Greece... Okay, thank you. For the record, ours is the only plan that will save their jobs. Next question. Question, Miles. Okay, Rice Conservatives, your plan claims to reduce the deficit by contracting the size of government, but government spending to help the most vulnerable automatically increases during recessions and stays high as long as the economy is struggling. Should we keep intact this major contributor to the deficit? We, in our plan, have nothing... Please answer the question. (laughs) Yes or no? Yes or no? Are you kidding me? Yes or no, Anthony? It's a yes or no question. This isn't a courtroom. I'm going to answer more than yes or no. Our plan has nothing about cutting spending. In fact, we could have just looked at this plan like some on the right have and cut spending. We took back and looked at a bipartisan solution that I think all Americans can agree with. But, but, but the question is, should we keep intact programs that, that contribute to the deficit, but they automatically go up during recessions to help those who have been hurt the most? We, where in this plan does it talk about cutting those programs? We are talking about contracting the size of government. That means government spending is going to go down. That's what your plan calls for. Our plan calls for contracting the size of government in regulation reform, immigration reform, and tax reform. So your reform. Yeah. So your doesn't mean every government service is cut. So you're completely okay with the fact that okay. So you guys Uh, agree that that last question, Dems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is last question. So you guys agree that the government can play a positive role in helping the unemployed, but we think the government should put people back to work rather than just helping them when they lose jobs. But you guys, do you agree with that? Do you agree that the government can help play a role in putting people back to work? I think the government does play a positive role, and it can put people back to work in select cases, but I don't think it's always the solution, and I think the private sector is what drives economic growth. And We're not suggesting that the government is the only solution either. We're just saying that in a time like this, when we have 24 million Americans who are unemployed or underemployed, we're trying to to help those folks out. All right. So um, thank you, Dan, for your questions. We're going to switch sides. But in the middle here, we have a little uh, the results of our pre-debate ballot, which asked uh, everyone whether they were fiscally conservative, fiscally liberal, fiscally moderate, or unsure. Um, And in the audience today, we have 22.86% that are fiscally conservative. 31.43% 31.43% that are fiscally liberal, 38.57% that are fiscally moderate, and 7% that are unsure. All right, Rice Conservatives, you have five minutes to ask questions. <laughs> that is, oh. All right, Rice Conservatives, you're up. Okay, um, we'd like to ask about this step up in basis of capital gains. Now, your, pro- your plan proposes to remove a leap- loophole that inefficiently increases tax basis on the assets at death. And so this would be assuming that the assets at death are worth more than they were when they were acquired, correct? Yes. Yeah. So we're just saying that we're not going to step up the basis. That's it. It doesn't matter whether they're worth more or they're worth less. We're just not going to increase the basis at death. That's it. Does it also assume that uh, after a loved one dies and passes on inheritance that the uh, the benefactor is going to sell these assets. But I mean, doesn't I mean, doesn't assume that they're going to sell it today. They could sell it tomorrow. They could sell it in 20 years. But we're just saying there's no need to step up the basis at the death. So that death. would mean that the 714 billion dollars is entirely predicated on the point at which an investor feels that the market is good enough to sell in. Correct? No, we're saying we're not going to step up the basis. So then people are going to be. Uh, more incentivized not to hold their assets, this lock-in effect that I tried to explain, right? So if they're more incentivized not to hold it, that is to say they're incentivized to sell because there's no deferral at death, when they sell, we'll collect the tax on that, as opposed to the lock-in when they don't sell and they sell it, you know, once like loved one dies, the basis steps up, there's lost revenue. All right, next question. Um, 
you talk about the $8 billion to promote innovation clusters like Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is an innovation cluster because of entrepreneurs working in their garages. How is the American government putting public sector and taxpayer money going to create innovation? Innovation comes from the private sector. I was... Yeah, no, Silicon Valley is a great example, but here's the thing with Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley did not start on its own. Silicon Valley leveraged the resources of Stanford, right? That's a tremendous amount of resources in one area, and it was able to you know, spring up spontaneously and contribute to the economy, and that's great. But there's only one Silicon Valley. Why can't we have 10? Why can't we have 20? Japan is spending uh, $300 million every year funding 102 different and growing innovation clusters throughout the country. But I would, we, first, first of all, I'm sorry to cut you that's off. Fine. Uh, first of all, I would say, yes, we're a little polite on this side. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I would not envy Japan's economy. And second of all, I'd like to ask what college Bill Gates went to or graduated from and Steve Jobs graduated from. These people took risks. That's what created Silicon Valley. I, I didn't even get the question. What's the question? I was responding. All right, you're trying to make the point that Bill Gates and Steve Jobs uh, didn't Can you go to college. Moving on to the next question. I was. That's not. That's not the point. The point what is. is the point? What is the point, Anthony? The point is that Stanford University and the leveraging of goods isn't what created Silicon Valley. What created question, Silicon question, Valley? Question, please, conservatives. Was. Okay, here's here's a question for you. Um, how do you justify $82 billion on pre-kindergarten education? And can you give us specific returns on this? Because your entire plan is predicated on the idea that you will have such precise billion-dollar figures of returns. So we ask you for these figures in returns from $82 billion on pre-K. Okay, so the return um, from different studies has shown um, up to 16 to 1. This is a huge case of an investment we make now that yields major dividends in the future. Early cognitive development, um, Nobel laureate James. James Heckman has said is a critical area for investment if America wants to keep its competitive edge. Invest early. That will reduce the achievement gap and give every American the chance to achieve the American dream. I just want to ask mainly, and we brought this up earlier, how can you get such specific figures when the government can't ever estimate how much money it's going to spend? That figure came from a Nobel laureate, a Nobel Prize winning economist, not the government, a Nobel laureate. I he might have won 10 Nobel Prizes, but I'm saying that no one can truly estimate how much an American government program is going to cost. Well, while it's true we that have it's thousands a, of people working on it and they fail. Question, please. So I'm service. wondering, I'm asking the same question again. How how do you get these numbers so specifically? And a Nobel Prize is not the answer. That, that number came from the econometric modeling of that Nobel laureate. And the question is, do we take a Nobel laureate's word or do we take the Rice Conservative's word? Frankly, I take a Nobel laureate's word over... The rights conservatives, or even the rights democrats, trust the Nobel laureate. We're, we're not saying that you should trust our no, Next question, please. Okay, the next question is, again, going to be related to the specificity. How can you justify a $5 billion surplus? Okay, what we're saying here is that our plan calls for $709 billion of spending. Okay, we're raising 714 so we're doing the math there to get $5 billion surplus. And the goal of the plan is not the surplus. The goal of the plan is to help put 24 million Americans back to work. That's not, I mean, the problem is not the deficit. The problem is the jobs deficit. All right. Last question, conservatives. Um, <laughs> I was just going to ask once again about the, as Rohini is saying, with the $5 billion, how can we be sure that we will not go further into debt with your plan? And how can we really promote jo job growth in America when we are putting America's debt further in the hole and we are risking our credit rating, which has already been jeopardized once this year? Look, first of all, the best thing we can do to reduce the debt is to drive growth now and in the long run. And second, in terms of those figures, those estimates, like Miles said, are based on the most accurate estimates we could find. The Office I mean, of Management least, and Budget. At least we made an attempt to put a price tag on our plan. And, and I also want to be clear, the downgrade, as we all know, was a mistake. They made a $2 trillion math there. And what did the markets do after the downgrade? Did they jack up our interest rates? No. The interest rates went down, proving the markets really don't care about this downgrade. All right, we're going to move to rebuttals and then conclusion. So, uh, Dems, you have two minutes for your rebuttal statement. The conservative plan has ignored the essence of this job crisis, a lack of demand. 
The claim that regulations are holding back this economy is simply not supported by the facts. But don't just take my word for it. A survey of job creators by the National Federation of Independent Business found that taxes and regulations have not become more burdensome under President Obama. The single most important problem they're facing, in their own words, is poor sales. Businesses will not prosper and create jobs without more consumer demand, and our plan is the only one that addresses this problem. Likewise, their plan for tax reform does not address this problem. When their tax reform plan isn't hiking taxes on job creators in the middle class, it's busy contradicting the regulation section. So apparently corporations can regulate themselves when it comes to pollution, financial dealings, and product safety, but they can't be trusted when it comes to putting in tax loopholes. Only the conservative plan has one section that says we must eliminate regulations and another section that imposes new ones. The claim that the revenue from tax reform will go to reduction uh, simply cannot be true without raising taxes on ordinary Americans. This alleged remedy is a poison pill. Tax hikes during a downturn will stifle growth. A less productive economy raises less revenue in the long run, making the debt problem worse. The deficit we need to be addressing isn't the federal budget deficit, it's the jobs deficit. Cutting regulations and simplifying the tax code are nice platitudes, but they're not credible plans for job creation. Only our plan addresses the real problem and will put America on the sustained path for long-run economic growth while creating jobs now. The Democrats' plan, our first issue, as we have raised several times in the question, is incredibly specific. No one person, Nobel Prize laureate, or even organization knows how much the government is spending money, because it is an overweening monster in Washington, and we have no idea how much these programs cost. We don't have specific price tags, because we don't have the hubris that we can know how much this is going to cost. In fact, we don't know how much money we can raise by cutting deductions because our tax code is seven volumes long. We are, it, would take, it takes more than one person to even begin to understand this. How can we have job growth and business and investing in America when they can't even understand their own taxes without hiring a panel of experts? For th they cl demand shortfall is important, and we agree that there is some, but we can't spend our way out of this problem. We've been trying to do that. We've been spending our way into deficit for the last 60 years, and we're now at $14 trillion. We can't sustain this amount of debt. We have seen in Europe that debt can and will undo countries. And we might say that it'll never happen to the United States, but five years ago, someone would never say that our credit would be questioned. Why can't five years from now, we can't imagine a situation where our creditors begin taking us to task and imposing austerity programs of their own and forcing us to lose our own sovereignty? We must think of solutions that don't require spending, simply spending more money. And reducing one deduction to maybe pay for all this isn't going to work. Innovation comes from the private sector, and that is what our plan emphasizes. Washington is not what makes America strong. It is the ordinary American businessman, and the, our plan allows the entrepreneur and the American businessman to exceed and thrive. Thank you. All right, Dems, you have two and a half minutes for a conclusion. Okay, thank you. Uh, today we heard two competing visions to solve this jobs crisis. Our plan is based on the best facts and figures that we could find. From independent agencies, from Nobel laureates, we provided specific facts because we want you to know that your tax dollars will be spent wisely. Our plan is the only plan that immediately tackles this jobs crisis. It's the only plan that cuts taxes for the middle class. The only plan that addresses what we both agree is the core problem, demand. And it's the only plan that will invest in research, which drives 40 to 70 percent of economic growth. Every penny of our plan is paid for. 
Our plan prevents the layoffs of hundreds of thousands of teachers, firefighters, and police officers, cuts taxes for the middle class, assists the unemployed, and puts Americans back to work, modernizing schools and repairing our broken infrastructure. Our plan is designed to prevent the short-term jobs crisis from becoming a long-term jobs nightmare. In addition to giving the economy a needed jolt to spur growth, our plan increases research and development funding by 20%, promotes the creation of regional innovation clusters like Silicon Valley, gives green cards to internationals um, earning science and technology PhDs, and expands pre-K education. This long-term jobs agenda will, uh, will close the achievement gap and enable more Americans to compete in the global economy. With steps today to create jobs immediately and long-term policies to foster sustainable jobs growth, our plan directly addresses the jobs crisis. We urge a resounding um, vote in favor of the Democratic plan to create jobs now and for the future. Thank you. And thank you to the conservatives. Thank you. Our plan offers three major reforms. The first is reform of regulation, which will result in less regulation and allow for more innovation in our country in terms of energy and other sectors. The second is immigration reform. As the Democrats have agreed with us upon, we need to make sure that Americans who come here to work can get, who come here to study can also come here to work. And third of all, we have a tax plan that will simplify the code, that will have a consumption tax so that all Americans can pl pay that federal tax, that lowers income tax on Americans, and that makes sure that corporate rates are not the highest in the world, at, uh, the highest of the OECD at 35%, but at 20% and enforced throughout all corporations. I would love to be able to spend America's money to give to American consumers so they can spend more money and spur on the demand of the country. Unfortunately, we can no longer do that. We cannot afford that. As Obama said before, while ending the war in Iraq, we just can't afford it. As Americans, we need to accept the fact that we can't afford everything, and we can't afford the Democrats' plan. We need to get ourselves out of this debt, and we need to make sure that America continues to be the best and safest place to do business. Thank you. All right, that's the end of the formal part of our debate chat. Can we give our, our debaters one more round of applause, please? Uh, you should all have a card that's uh, asking you to vote on which plan you preferred. So if you could fill those out and pass them to this side, uh, your right, my left. And then the bidders have uh, agreed to answer your questions while we tally the votes. So if you could just raise your hand and I'll call on people while we go. Gabe, I have a question for you. I, 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 tried, I tried to ask this earlier, but the way you guys have done the questions when you're determining the winner, you, you took it. Can we talk about this afterwards, Sean? Let's just like let audience ask regular questions that are relevant. I, I'm just going to, yeah. to to read the results. We're not going to worry about uh, naming a winner. So, okay, good, Danny. Uh, so <laughs> sir, is this for you? Someone? You guys talk about ending cap gains. I just want to ask uh, a couple questions about that. One, are you aware that the cap gains tax is the lowest it's ever been? Two, are you aware that under the two longest periods of economic expansion, Clinton and Kennedy, cap gains were higher than they were now? My final question is, how can you talk about creating job growth when 83% of all cap gains are paid by people who make over 200000 and 61% of all cap gains are made by $2 million income people? How does that create job growth? I believe that just because cap gains are the lowest they have been, we shouldn't have them at all. We should have no taxes on investment. Investment is exactly what we should be encouraging, not decouraging. So I would respond to that and say, you know, corporations are sitting on $1.9 trillion, you know, j just in excess, right? And yet they're still not investing, even though you have some of the lowest interest rates and some of the lowest capital gains rates that we've had in history. So how would lowering those rates even more you know, actually get these get this two trillion off their shelves. Well, I think that it's we need to signify to American businesses that America is a place where they can invest, and I think taking away taxes on investment is a way to do that. All right, we're going to ne next question. We'll go in black shirt back and back. Yeah, um, my question I guess is for both. How does taking money out of the, uh, out of productive sectors of the economy for investment create jobs? 
for, for the conservatives, I guess. If, if you had a... Wait, do you mean investment by the government or invest... All right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I believe that it can create jobs if it's targeted. Let's just say the American highway system created jobs because it was infrastructure. But I believe in most cases it doesn't create jobs. That's why we got $200,000 per job in the Obama plan. The government can't allocate resources nearly as well as the private sector. That's what capitalism is for, and that's what the whole price mechanism is for. That's why our plan doesn't involve government spending money to create jobs. Your thesis would be exactly right, but there's one hitch. Companies are sitting on $2 trillion, but they're not spending it. So if they are not spending it, we will not create jobs. So what do we have to do now? The government has to come in and step in and provide the demand of last resource. And, and we're not talking about spending money on frivolous things. We're talking about repairing schools, modernizing them, repairing our infrastructure. There's no reason why we should be getting a D on our infrastructure. And moreover, when these go... When the governments make these investments, there's a multiplier effect that is to say each dollar that's spent, you know, creates more economic growth. It's not true. Keynesian economics has never worked anywhere. The <laughs> how did we get out of the how did we get out of the Great Depression by spending money on the New Deal and then by spending money on World War II? That is called Keynesian economics 101. There was a study <laughs> by UCLA that, that said that the Great Depression was extended for five years by Roosevelt's policies. There's abs right because Roosevelt's because, policies because we that pulled were not, back because not we had Asian. to because we pulled back too quickly, right? We pulled back too quickly, and then World War II spending, and that's how we got out of it. All right, let, let, we're I'm happy go to talk to, to you after this. I'm happy to talk afterwards. Uh, let's go. Let's go and get to the next question. We're in the green shirt right here. Um, my question is for the Rice Democrats about the uh, payroll tax cuts. Uh, what is the time frame for the 174 billion uh, cost? How uh, over what time is that cost generated? Okay, that's a that's a good question. Um, it's just over the next fiscal year. Um, it's a reason we're doing this is because right now, uh, yesterday, the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco announced we have a 50 percent chance of going back into a recession. And we think the economy needs an extra push to stay out of recession. So would that be for only one year or for the entire 10 years? Um, we, we only appropriated funds for one year because we think the next year the economy is in danger of going into recession. And we want to prevent that. We're here in the blue. Hi. Uh, this is for the conservatives. So y'all have talked a lot about fiscal responsibility. Uh, and about cutting massive amounts of taxes. Now, returning the uh, taxes to rating levels on the top 2% would raise about $700 billion, or taking half of the money of the bottom 50% of Americans would raise about $700 billion. Now, if you want to cut all of capital gains taxes and lower income taxes at the top brackets, where and where are you going to pay for this spending? We're going to lower income taxes across all Americans and institute a VAT and abolish deductions and loopholes, which will create an incredible amount of revenue. So where are you? So you're going to do it by raising a VAT? You're going to replace all... And by cutting deductions and loopholes and enforcing the corporate tax code on all corporations so corporations who have friends in Washington don't can pay zero dollars while some corporations have to pay 35%. We're going to disincentivize consumption instead of... Um, and give more money to investors who aren't investing right now. They're sitting on billions. Why aren't Ameri Why aren't investors investing now? That's the question we should be asking. And, and that wasn't. A, that was a retort. That was. Can Can I finish talking for once? Like one day, maybe. Why aren't Americans? Why aren't investors investing? Because they don't believe that America is a place to in, worth investing in. If they did think they'd make money, if they did think America was a good place to do business, they would be investing. So let's make America that place to do business instead of just having government spending more money. Next question. All right, can we go in the black back in? There? This question was in, uh, in debate was proposed by the uh, Democrats, but. I think the answer was a little bit was a little bit vague by the conservative forum. So this is for the conservative forum, which is that, as we all know, the corporate tax rate is one of the highest in the world at 35 percent. But um, according to a lot of research, and this I just read yesterday on PlayFact.com, most businesses or the average business is actually only paying like 13 percent in corporate tax rates because of the loophole system. So if you cut out the loopholes and you set a flat tax at 20 percent, you're on average effectively raising taxes for corporate tax rate by 7 percent. And so I'm wondering how that actually would help create job growth rather than end job. We're going to raise corporate taxes on the companies that are basically cheating. That's what we're going to do. And companies that pay zero dollars in corporate taxes should be spending some money. 35% is too high, and we need to lower it. But that doesn't mean that no... How does that, is, is, is how does that raising of taxes create job growth? It makes America a 
fair and safe place to do business because you know who's getting out of those tax cuts? The big corporations that can take it. We need to make American entrepreneurs and small businesses comfortable because they're the ones that are going to get screwed over. And lower the barriers to entry. Just a, a quick response to the small businesses say the biggest problem they face is sales. Not regulations, not taxes, it's sales. They need more customers. Our plan puts money back in the pockets of customers. Next question. All right, we're going to do, we're going to do two more questions and then um, read the results. So, Thomas, you want to ask your question? Yeah, I have a question actually about the structure of the regulatory review board. I think in the plan it said something about uh, business leaders and something along that line. What, biz, what industries would you use for this regulatory res, uh, review board, and how would you ensure that their own interests wouldn't play a part in their decision-making? Yeah, so we have a system of checks and balances. We'd have not only industry leaders, but industry experts and entrepreneurs. So we make sure that the small guys as well as the large corporations are covered. That way we don't just create some super lobby group. And, and let's be sure that these boards wouldn't create policy on their own. That'd be unconstitutional. Eventually, all of their recommendations would go through the American elected officials and therefore to the American voter. We're not talking about American... We're letting American government and American business work together to create regulation instead of the current system in which American reg American government just imposes regulation top down. Uh, and, and, and if I just, I, uh, let me respond to that, Raj. I mean, uh, if I could say briefly, uh, I mean, uh, President Obama's already modernized and removed more burdensome rules and regulations in three years than our last president did in eight. And I mean, uh, on, under the status quo, non-essential regulations are being eliminated every day in the pages of the Federal Register. You can look it up for yourself on federalregister.gov if you don't believe me. Regulations and burdensome rules are already being removed. Well, you say he cut more, but he also imposed more. We have uh, we have uh, Dodd Frank, Obamacare. We have all of his czars. Right, but but let's be clear, right? Dodd Frank was put in place because this financial crisis that we face was precipitated because of a lack of regulation, right? And that's not a democratic idea. That's a nonpartisan idea. But Dodd Frank isn't smart regulation. Dodd Frank is overweening regulation. You're but. We, that's that's a debate for another thing. I think we should take the next question. All right, we're going to do, do one, one last question. Um, the guy in the gray has had a hand up for most of the time. So uh, there was one thing that came up in the debate that I didn't think was fleshed out. Well, Romini, you actually brought this up. So a big part of this is, right, is establishing cost. And what we were talking about with the Democrats' plan was uh, – it's not the only – I don't think it's the only, but one of the biggest points was uh, – with changing the basis and how we do that. But but one thing that Rohini brought up is there's a certain uh, propensity or probability that you know when someone inherits something, they'll either spend it or they won't spend it. So really, the, the, the thing to consider here is, I think, the time frame. Because if we're talking about immediate solutions that require for them not to be overly costly, uh, for to have them, the, the assumption could be, I'm not necessarily assuming, I would like you all to talk about this, but uh, is the, if the assumption is that they're going to inherit this and immediately spend, then that could cover all the costs. But that not that I don't think that's necessarily the case. And so I think some discussion about the time frames on this, when they spend, when they choose to spend, when they don't, uh, could actually uh, be something that would be really helpful because on both sides, cost is a good point. And I, I think uh, Roni's point was a little bit cut short. And I'm really interested in seeing what both y'all have to say about that. Sure, sure. Please, Rohini, go ahead. Um, okay, so our point is this. Your plan is predicated on the idea that we are going to remove the step-up basis, which will allow investors, the people who hold the investments, either the relatives of a deceased family member or the family member themselves, will want to sell them because they're not afraid of this tax payment. They can pay it at any point. So our question then isn't, shouldn't isn't this entire idea then based on the idea that investors or whoever holds these assets feels comfortable enough with our market to sell them that all of the revenue generated from any tax would only be generated once these assets were sold your step up basis is not a tax based on holding assets but rather when you sell them so our problem with the immediacy is that if our market isn't really comfortable right now and investors don't feel comfortable selling i know i wouldn't sell my stocks today how do we know when they're going to sell them and how can we have the immediacy of 714 billion dollars if not everyone sells today? Very good question and a great point. But here's what I would say. One, um, we got our numbers from the Office of Management and Budget, and this is their predictions for how much will be raised in one year, five years, and 10 years. So that's the first thing I would say. And the second thing I would say is th what would probably happen is if we remove the step up of basis, okay, that would reduce the lock-in effect, right? So people who own the shares are 
less likely to bequeath them, right? Because, I mean, part of the calculus when bequeathing capital goods is that my uh, heirs don't have to pay the tax on it, right? The step up of basis, that's part of the reason. That's called the lock-in effect. So if we remove the step up of basis, you're going to discourage the lock-in effect so more people will sell it during their lives. Does that make sense? So, and, and then each year we're going to, I mean, I mean, again, this is predicted by the OMB, right? 60 million the first year, 315 over, or 317 over 5, 715 over 10. So this money is all predicated on the idea that people are, that are holding assets of a given value that the OMB has predicted will sell these assets at this time during the first year once we remove the step-up basis. I mean... During with, the first 10 years. Sorry. With with each model, I mean, you have to make assumptions, you make predictions. And again, this is, a, I mean, you're trying to predict 10 years out. I mean, could there be a mistake? Yes. I mean, we're not going to sit here and say they're exactly right on their numbers. But again, this is a forecast. It was the best numbers we had. And we thought we should at least try to be somewhat specific in our plan, as opposed to this general plan here with, with zero numbers. I see zero citations. Uh, quick, quick question, Nuric. You, you're spending the uh, payroll tax cuts, the spending all that. What time frame is that? So, yeah, so it depends on each one. So I think if we turn to page three of the plan, Right. It says here, depending on. So these the immediate ones are, you know, the first couple of years and then the investing in the future over the next five. Right. Our problem was just that the idea that you're going to justify your entire plan is going to be paid for by removing these loopholes. Yet your payment is all predicated on different time periods, which makes your plan increasingly complex. And we're not sure if you can pay for it today or if you can pay for it in 10 years when investors have more confidence. Okay, in let, let, let's go to another question. Okay, this all right, is, no, I, I got it. <laughs> All right, guys, so I'd like to thank everybody again for coming today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. So I'm going to announce the results here in a second, and everyone is, is free to go when you're ready. Our debaters have agreed to stay for another 10 or, our debaters have agreed to stay for another 10 or 15 minutes uh, if you'd like to keep taking questions. Um, but uh, I'll just announce the results, and then please feel free to just sneak out as, as you'd like. Um, a 74.6% uh, of the people in the room today uh, favored more the Democrats' plan, and then the other 25.4% favored more the Rice Conservative Forum plan. So, uh, again, thank you very much for coming. Like I said, our debaters are happy to take a couple more questions uh, if you'd like to stick around. Otherwise, uh, have a great evening.